presentation, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Next slide, Anna, please. Um, welcome again, everybody, to our RICMAR webinar today. This webinar is being hosted by the National Coordinating Center of the RICMARs at UCLA. With funding from the NIA, the Coordinating Center at UCLA works to disseminate RICMAR prophecies, tools, and research results to actively demonstrate the RICMAR's impact upon the health of minority older adults in the U.S. As a land-grant institution, UCLA and the RICMAR Coordinating Center acknowledges our presence on the traditional ancestral territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people. And we hope you can take a minute this morning to acknowledge the ancestral lands that you are currently on. The staff at the Coordinating Center work very hard to provide you with updated information about opportunities and resources related to aging in diverse communities. So we invite you um, to visit our website regularly for updates and announcements and to follow us on social media. Just a few reminders before we begin. Um, please note that we are using Zoom meeting for today's webinar. That means that we can see you and hear you. Um, so we will be muting everybody in order to facilitate the recording of this session. Just so you know, we will be distributing today's slides to registered participants and posting the recorded session on our website. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Let our speaker know who's in the audience by typing in the institution or the RICMAR site that you are affiliated in the chat. In order to get the most out of today, please note that you can enter your questions into the chat and we will be monitoring those and um, asking Dr. Norris to address them after his talk. Next slide. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Keith Norris is an internationally recognized clinician scientist and health policy leader who has been instrumental in shaping national health policy and clinical guidelines for chronic kidney disease. He has made major contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion while addressing disparities in contemporary society. He obtained his medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine and completed his residency training and chief residency in internal medicine and trained in nephrology at the combined West LA VA UCLA program. Dr. Norris's research interest focuses on hypertension and chronic kidney disease in disadvantaged populations. He was the principal investigator for the multi site NIH funded African American study of kidney disease and hypertension and the follow up cohort study the largest comparative drug intervention trial focusing on renal outcomes conducted in African Americans. He has extensive experience in patient recruitment and retention and community partnered research within the South LA community. He directs a number of different programs, training programs at UCLA. Um, he's one of the co-PIs of the NIH Diversity Program Consortium and the uh, Coordination and Evaluation Center at UCLA, which is a centerpiece of the largest NIH initiative to enhance diversity in the biomedical workforce. But most importantly for us today, he's part of RICMAR Chime and an advocate, supporter, and leader of our RICMAR efforts nationwide. Um, my honor to um, welcome you, Dr. Norris, a colleague and a friend, um, to this morning's talk. Feel free to begin sharing your slides. Okay. Thank you very much for that very generous welcome, Lourdes. And good day to everybody in the Rickmar community. Thanks for joining today. And so we thought a few months ago with things that were going on, we'd talk about race and racism and particularly how it, we might think about it in our research. And clearly, uh, that topic has continued to be high on the radar screen. So I have no significant conflicts of interest, except that I believe in a society grounded in equity and justice. So that will, that will influence in my biases. So we're going to put up the first poll. And um, there's a statement there 
And then I just want you to say if you agree with it, yes, if you don't, no. So given race and ethnicity are social constructs, and given the increase in racial tensions and violence, it is time to consider moving beyond race and ethnicity in medical research and maybe use socioeconomic status instead. So that's the, that's the statement. And we're getting some responses there. Okay, that's, so it looks like about 25% say yes and 75% say no. So good, good. Some things to talk about as we go forward today. Did I get this one? So if I can get out of results here, we can move the poll. I'm not to get the poll here. Okay. So the Rick Moore program is designed to enhance the diversity of aging research workforce, primarily by mentoring promising scientists from underrepresented groups with a focus on social, behavioral, and economic research on aging and simultaneously increasing the number of researchers focused on health disparities and the health of well-being, health and well-being of minority elders. And so that's really capturing a lot of the social determinants of health. And so that's very important for Rick Moore. And so I think it's important that we think about the work we do, uh, the inequitable distribution of these social determinants and how that may impact the health for oppressed minority groups. So clearly, uh, I think everybody here in, in this community is aware of the inequities in society and medicine that lead to disparities and, and these dis inequities also undermine the optimal care for all persons. So those are things that we want to try to better understand and be able to address. I think it's also important when we see findings coming up over and over again, that we understand these are not by accident and that there are systems in place and those systems continue to achieve these same results. And the quote for that is here. It's usually attributed to Dr. Don Berwick, former uh, chief administrator for CMS. And so we really want to think about what are the systems we need to impact if we want to achieve some different outcomes? One in particular is structural racism. So we think about the social determinants of health, the inequitable distribution of those resources. The term that's used to define that is structural racism. And it's been highlighted with the COVID-19 pandemic and seen in the cartoon to your left as you're facing the screen is uh, the inequitable distribution based on what floor you're living on in that cartoon. And so you can see people at the higher levels have um, better housing, less crowding, and less sickness. And, and so that has really been a, a highlight of how structural racism can impact health. And I think there are many lessons that we can learn in the Rick Moore community. So just a few definitions getting started. Uh, race and ethnicity. So despite its official status, race is a misnomer. There's only one race, the human race. Uh, that being said, we use race all the time. The Pan-American Health Organization and World Health Organization uh, use ethnicity. And they use ethnicity to characterize different groups that share traditions, ancestry, language, et cetera, religion, cult, uh, nationality. And so if you think about it, we use, we break, we have uh, white, black, Asian, uh, Native American. 
there are many different groups in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, of people that are totally different. So uh, it's clear that race ethnicity doesn't really capture. In the United States, what we do is we've classified ethnicities into those that speak Spanish as it, or come from a country that speaks Spanish as its primary language versus those that don't. So it's pretty arbitrary. Historically, for those who may not be aware, the creation of race sort of is, appears to date back to uh, Francis Bernoir in France, uh, who made these who made racial classifications into American, European, Asian, and African. And then Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern taxonomy, added to these classifications personal attributes. And he gave the more favorable attributes to European or white and the least favorable to African or black. And that was important for helping to establish a sense of uh, genetic or biologic differences between groups and this, the ability to justify superiority and inferiority. So race is a social political construct to control power based on how people look. And it's derived from this uh, ideology of white race being greater than other races. And that was primarily put in place to justify and maintain chattel slavery and the genocide and oppression of Native, Native Americans. As a research variable, because race is a sociopolitical construct, it is a very poor indicator of biology. And what it is, it's a strong indicator of exposure to racism. And so what race ends up being is how society sees you and how society thinks of you. Racism is really a system. And so we want to get away from thinking of racism as a, an individual uh, level of bias, but really a system. And that system structures opportunity and assigns value based on how people look. And it fairly or unfairly disadvantages some communities. And in doing that, it saps the strength from the whole of society by wasting human resources. Racism is what society does to you based on how it sees you. So what about race and ethnicity in research? So this is a conceptual model from uh, Tom Leviste, created this about 25 years ago. And here, he characterizes race as this sort of uh, latent or unobserved factor and physiognomy, the sort of how one looks. So people look at someone, they see them, and then they characterize someone and, and people end up becoming placed into society, um, grouping into a culture per se, or an ethnic group. That society can also influence culture and how culture may adapt to maintain or navigate within that society. Our, our culture or ethnic group might do that. Those can also influence health and wellness through a variety of behaviors and beliefs. And then there are a variety of, ex variety of external risk exposures or a variety of external exposures that happens in that society. And all those um, lead to variations in health outcomes. And we use, typically see these by differences in race. And so these differences, frequently we talk about disparities. And so there, again, there may be differences in clinical outcomes by race or ethnicity. And usually when we think about disparities, we typically talk about race, ethnicity, but we frequently also talk about uh, gender or sex, age and others. Um, geographic. Importantly, the distinction between disparities and differences are disparities are felt to be those differences that are generated because society is unjust. And so if things were equal, then, and those differences still exist, then it's not a disparity, it's just a difference. But a disparity is that, that, is gen that difference that is generated because of inequities in society. 
And so we have institutionalized racism, residential segregation, and others. And they're all shown here on this little figure where a variety of factors can lead to differences in health outcomes between majority and uh, racial ethnic minority groups. And most of these are influenced by structural racism, although some may be related to um, other factors. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So if we can have the next poll. So here's another statement. So health beliefs and health preferences may lead to differences in health outcomes. So therefore they should not be considered disparities. And this, came, this question came up from comments from a reviewer on a manuscript that a colleague of mine had submitted. And they were going back and forth about whether or not um, outcomes and health beliefs and health preferences should be considered differences or disparities. So we about 20% yes and 80% no. Okay, we can end the poll. Okay, here we are. So, tough question. Actually, let's go back. So, sometimes health beliefs and health behaviors can be under the control of an individual. But a lot of times, society can influence your beliefs and your behaviors. And so, if a person is not adherent to their medication, one could say that's an individual level, and therefore that's a difference. But one could also conceptualize where the inability to be adherent to medication is due to structural inequities, lack of income, a person trying to make decisions with limited resources. Am I going to feed my family or am I going to get my medication? And so in those instances, it would in fact be a disparity and not a difference. So it's not clear cut but it's something that we have to think about, and particularly in the Rick Moore community, when we are dealing with many of the patients we're dealing with, the research we're dealing with, those are important questions we have to ask ourselves and, and think about as we're framing both our study designs or, and interpreting our results. So again, in thinking about health disparities, we clearly see a lot of research in health disparities, and usually, we, and for health disparities research, Usually, investigators are comparing racial and ethnic groups. And I have a title here, Change in Cardiometabolic Risk Among Black, White, and Hispanic Individuals from the Health and Retirement Study. So there you're able to compare groups, and that's health disparities. A lot of, it, a lot of investigators are more concerned in what's called minority health research. That is, understanding what's going on within a particular racial or ethnic group. And so here are two studies, one among black men, one among Hispanic caregivers. Um, and so in these studies, the patient cohort or the population cohort is limited to a racial or ethnic group. And a lot of times, particularly in grants and sometimes even in papers when people are submitting manuscripts, they will get comments back from reviewers questioning the work that they're doing if they're doing minority health research and challenging them to change their research, stating that they have to have a comparison against the quote unquote control group, which are white individuals. And that can be very disconcerting for a lot of investigators. And it, it suggests that those individuals do not have a good understanding of the differences in types of research that people may be conducting and the types of understandings people are trying to distill from the research that they're doing. So along those lines, uh, Rhea Boyd and colleagues recently uh, published a blog in Health Affairs talking about uh, 
consideration for new standards for publishing on racial health inequities. And what they state is the paper should define race as part of the experimental design and specify the reason for its use. And then to name racism or the mechanism through which racism may be operating as well as in other intersecting forms of oppression, be it sex, sexual orientation, age, religion, nationality, et cetera, and how those may uh, work together. And they say this because naming racism explicitly helps the authors avoid incorrectly assigning race as a risk factor for these racial disparate outcomes when race is really the exposure variable and racism is the risk factor. Okay. They further state that if race and genetics are being expressed jointly, to painstakingly delineate the intended implication. And they state you should never offer genetic interpretations of race because such suppositions are not grounded in science. And I thought about that and I was like, well, you know, there can be some genetic associations with polymorphisms, but actually those are not, they're associated with race, but they are not, they are not definitive of race, right? So if we want to know the genetic interpretations, then we actually need to use ancestral linkages and the association is restricted to that gene polymorphism or marker, but not race. Race may have an association, but it is not it is not specifically related or, or linked to that genetic interpretation. For much of this work, consider soliciting patient input. And so for many people who do uh, collaborative research with patients, with community members, having uh, individuals who reflect the population or the priorities of the population that's being studied can be very valuable in giving us insights into the interpretation of what we do and the recommendations that we might make. And then identify what it is we're trying to accomplish. Frequently, research on racial ethnic health inequities should give us group level results. And those group level results can be important for public policy, for health messaging, um, community messaging, um, screening, things of that nature. And so we really want to identify what it is we sought to do and then what it is we recommend be done with the results from our findings. And then they recommend, if you're working in that space, to cite experts who do work in that space, which seems pretty reasonable. Another thing, as we think about the research we're doing is in this space is that words matter. And many terms have changed over time. Sometimes it changes slowly, sometimes it changes more quickly. We're with the more recent social racial justice movement, there's been a big push to be more specific about terminology. And, and there's a greater need to harmonize medical sciences with social sciences, and even the social sciences vary uh, in the words they use, the terminology they use. But it's important that we think through what we, how the words we use to avoid the subtle narratives that reinforce racist ideologies. So here's some examples, right? So in sometimes in, a met, in the methods approach, they will talk about uh, things uh, being segregated. That's probably not the best term to use in a paper talking about certain racial and ethnic issues. And so maybe use partitioned or segmented. Using, instead of using human subjects, participants. Instead of the target population, population of interest. The target population again sounds like a group that's you know it's being targeted, and that's 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 not a, a great feeling. Instead of underserved, under resourced, right? Our many of our communities, not that they're not served, they don't have the resources. And then subtle things we see in many manuscripts, uh, lowercase black and white being used, which I could never figure out because it is a proper noun, right? when used to define a group of people, it's a proper noun and proper nouns should be capitalized. So I would always get pushback from journals. I can never figure out why a journal wants to be grammatically incorrect. 
but they would always go back to some policy they have. But now many journals are in fact using black and white um, with capital letters when referring to a group of individuals. Otherwise, they refer to colors. And then we need to push back as, um, as authors to reviewers and journals for the narratives for not changing words and language, right? They'll say there is no better language. Science is race neutral, reflects the literature. There's no better language. And, and so things like that. And I, I have to look at that myself all the time when I'm writing things um, and putting together publications, putting together grant proposals, and I'm changing my language around to be more specific. And a lot of times for many of us, it was how many times do you want to push back or do I just want to get my publication published, right? I want to get my paper published. So you just acquiesce. So I think we need to push at least as hard as we can. And then thinking about our research, what are some things? Do we really understand what race and ethnicity means to us in the study we're doing? And again, is there that intersection? Are we thinking about that intersection with um, sex, linguistic background, sexual orientation, or other? Do we have the right partners at the table, if, depending on the research we're doing? And have we thought through the impact of structural racism or other forms of racism either, you know, depending on the study design and how we're looking at um, and, and what type of research that's being conducted. <clears throat> and so again, think how and why we are examining race ethnicity. Always be cognizant that there's substantial heterogeneity in each group, right? We always wanna be thinking about structural racism for anything being done in this country because structural racism is embedded into the fabric of this country. And so it affects everything. It's very important to be cognizant that race and ethnicity are not surrogates for socioeconomic status, okay? Um, race is a risk factor for racism and exposure to racism is a risk factor for health disparities. So just think about that. Race is a risk factor for racism. Exposure to racism is a risk factor or at least racial, race, race, race and, eth and ethnic based health disparities. So when we think about some of the research we're doing, particularly the qualitative research, then we want to include, think about community engaged research and or other qualitative studies, uh, focus groups, et cetera, to better contextualize our findings. And historically, we also need to be cognizant that um, in 2010, with the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, there has been uh, a change in the percentage of people that are now uninsured. We have a much lower percentage of the population that's uninsured. And so that, that may impact access to care and some of the results we see in the research we're doing, and we need to be cognizant of that in thinking about how we interpret our findings. Importantly, when we're thinking about insurance, though, insurance does not equal access to care. Insurance equals potential access to care. People still have may, what's, may have what's called narrow networks where their insurance may link them to providers that are nowhere near where they live. His, uh, historical and contemporary mistreatment can lead to mistrust and therefore people may be reticent to access care. Their job situation, transportation, particularly for people who have um, many frontline jobs, they're not in a position that they can readily access care. So a variety of factors can still access care um, or at least uh, impact access to care. For people with doing Medicare analyses, at least with Medicare, we, we see that there's a change in insurance status. So people, if they did not have insurance, and depending on their situ situation, if they paid into Medicare, they now have insurance and it leads to some equity and access to care. But what we also be, also have to be cognizant now that we're looking at population that has a level of insurance, 
there are a variety of factors that still impact different groups differentially as to how and why they made it to 65 years of age. And so there may be survivor bias, and then there may we have to think about maybe do we need to control for a lifetime exposure to a variety of wear and tear factors that lead to weathering and increase our allostatic load. For Medicaid, those analyses, again, represent potential equity and access for lower income older populations, as well as for children. Some of the closed system analyses, people working with large databases with Kaiser or the Veterans Association, um, there you can do analyses that look at what happens to different populations where there is much more equity in care, but there may be biases in the mix of patients and how one gets to be included in that health system. In open health systems, you can have a lot more data that is probably more generalizable to the general population, but again, there may be some biases in, who get, in, in who's able to get care in those systems. And then we have large observational data sets, which are not health systems, but it's just gathering specific types of information from populations, and many of these are frequently used to look at racial ethnic differences in a variety of aspects of health conditions for many investigators in the Rick Mark community. So if we can go to the next poll. So the next statement is to capture the impact of structural racism, controlling for community level factors. Hmm. What's missing here? So to capture the impact of structural racism, we should control for community level factors, and we should not look at biological factors because biological factors reinforces racism. Okay? So to capture the impact of structural racism, we should control for community level factors. We should not look at biological factors because biological factors reinforces racism because race is a social and not a biological construct. How cool, it's a big battle, neck and neck, coming down the stretch. It's yes in the lead. And yes, it's turning the corner. And yes wins, okay. So we should control for community factors. We should not look at biologic factors. So I'm not, probably not, again, totally, Clear? Um, let's see. Okay. So we do often want to try to capture structural racism by controlling for community level factors. And it's probably the best single um, domain in which to capture structural racism. But there are many other aspects of society that structural racism impacts that is more difficult to control, psychological factors, uh, life cost trauma, intergenerational trauma. And in fact, those traumas and impacts can influence our biology. And so we often use allostatic load or immune and stress markers. Some people use epigenetic markers to gain more insight into the physiologic effects of structural racism, okay? So we wanna think about that. Yes, we could, in fact, gain some insights. And so a lot of times, if we really want to try to start touching upon the impact of structural racism, we have to capture a variety of these variables, if, in fact, they're, they are um, available in the projects or work that we're doing. <clears throat> so we think about capturing community-level factors. Uh, there are a variety of strategies and approaches. So some use what's called the socioeconomic disadvantage uh, index or area deprivation index. CDC now uses what's called social vulnerability index. But first, before we look at this, let's go back to we say words matter. So we, we use this to look at disparities and what's going on predominantly with minority populations. And so we have the disadvantage, the deprivation, and the vulnerability indices. What they are, are social inequity or social oppression indices. That's what they actually are. 
And so that's what we should call them. So we need to be thinking about the terms we use and the language we use because the language plays an important role in first making sure that we are not blaming the victim, not blaming that community or that individual, and that and the language also helps us think through what we want to do or need to do in thinking about uh, interventions going forward. And so there are a list of of factors here that are commonly used in creating these indices. And these at least help to control for some of the differences in the inequitable distribution of the social determinants of health that can be important for understanding variable, for, for understanding why certain communities are having variations in health outcomes. But there is a biology for racism. And so we want to, so I just want to spend a minute or two about the biology of racism and, and, and how that is something we might be thinking about in the work we do. And particularly working with minority elders, many of whom are very familiar with what happened during the pre-civil rights era and the level of hatred and vitriol expressed um, explicitly, which we really hadn't seen for quite a while again until recently. So weathering. So here's some pictures of former President Barack Obama. We see his hair going from black to gray in a short period of time through the weathering of being president. And Arlene Geronimus from Michigan describes it as the cumulative impact of the repeated experience of social and or economic adversity, as well as political marginalization. <clears throat> and when we think about the impact of a variety of different, of these different adversities, they are again uh, distributed differently across black and white patients or, or communities or participants. So in this study, um, major discrimination, everyday discrimination, major life events, and socioeconomic status adversity, much higher in black participants than white participants. Now notice here in the legend, we have blacks versus whites. And a lot of times in many of the manuscripts, we're trying to save time, we put that there. Personally, it doesn't offend me, but I know for a lot of people that they see those terms as offensive and so um, try to move to use uh, black participants or black individuals, white participants, white individuals. And again, that would be the preferred language and the direction in which we wanna go. And so in this slide, uh, again, from the Midas study, and this is a, a midlife, uh, U.S. study, ages 35 to 85 here, I changed it from blacks and whites to black participants and white participants. But notice measures of inflammation, CRP, interleukin-6, and E-selectin, much higher in the black participants than the white participants, despite the fact that they're five years younger. And so, and in addition, higher rates of uh, higher levels of fasting glucose and insulin resistance and other markers of uh, weathering per se or adverse cardiometabolic profile. And so this sort of suggests that we see, we're seeing these biologic responses occur or these biologic changes or differences occurring in response to uh, society and, and, and and so we can see where, how society can have an impact on our physiology and our biology. And this is highlighted here where in the vertical axis, we have the predicted probability of allostatic load. And this is a measure of a variety of factors from uh, blood pressure and C-reactive protein and more that are associated with increased mortality and age. And the two uh, lines or curves at the top with circles are black participants. The, um, the closed circles are lower income, open circles are higher income. And you notice there's a, a higher probability 
of an increased allostatic load at every age for black participants, then white participants, and, and for both black and for both white participants, lower income also has a higher predictive probability. Importantly, high income black participants have a higher allostatic load than low income white participants at the same age. And so that suggests that while there is a, a component related to income, there's a component related to an individual's race, which again, we know is the exposure. And so all those other factors we would have to look at to understand why a group from a given race is exhibiting this finding. Looking time wise. And again, looking at factors for inflammation, um, even after controlling for sociodemographics, health behaviors, and psychosocial uh, factors such as depression and anxiety, a still a significantly higher level of inflammatory markers in black participants than white participants. So I'm going to ask everybody to. Just look at this, uh, look through these questions. This is the Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire for Adults. So I want you to look, th look at these and just jot down for yourself, yes or no, do you have any of these? And count up how many of these did you experience as a child? So this survey is created for adults to reflect back to when they were a child and score what their childhood experience was. So we're not gonna poll, I just want you to think about what you're, Create your number and know what your number was. Did you have enough to eat? Did you wear dirty clothes? Did you have no one to protect or care for you? Did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment, et cetera, et cetera? So just go through these and, and jot down your number. And now, just to give you a little feedback, 61% of adults had at least one adverse childhood experience. And just a little more than 15% have four or more. Women and several racial ethnic minority groups are more likely to experience four or more. And people who experience four or more are two and a half times more likely have obesity, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, blah, 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 all, all the bad things that'll happen to you. So what that says is, a lot of times, it's not, in a sense, what's wrong with you or as a group, what's wrong with them, it's what happened to you or it's what happened to them, right? And so we have these structural factors and these structural factors in, have a, an impact both um, young growing up in our household, as well as after we leave the household and we enter the broader society, there continues to be a variety of, of pressures that lead to different um, outcomes per se. So again, racism can affect not only communities and community structures, but biology can affect health beliefs, health behaviors, and health practices. So it's critical for us to think about the role of race as a variable or potential exposure when we're doing work and we're uh, constructing multi-level models um, for our analyses. I'm going to say, importantly, race and ethnicity data is really, it gives us group-level data that we use to inform public health and community messages. We use it for screening. We use it for monitoring progress for modifying systems and policy recommendations, as well as to increase awareness for providers that that group, if someone belongs to that group, they're at a group that has a higher risk, but recognizing that that risk is predominantly driven by socio-political factors. So I'm gonna skip this last part here. <clears throat> so I wanna save some time for questions. And
where are we time wise here? Yeah. So I'm going to end here. I will take I will take questions because we have about 15 minutes left. So I'll just end by saying uh, I want to thank everybody for their time. We'll make the slides available and. Uh, in the top of the corner here, we have a variety of factors that are uh, major components. When we think about structural racism and social determinants of health, and we're thinking about equity and how we can improve disparities, I just want to say, ultimately, to eliminate disparities, we have to create equity in each of the systems that you see in the panel there, from education, economic housing. Until then, we you know, we're doing important work, but we're working around the margins, trying to work around the inequities, and at some point we have to actually address these inequities. So thank you for your time, and um, you know, see if we can answer or at least entertain some questions here. Thank you, Dr. Norris. So uh, just a reminder, feel free to enter your questions into the chat, and I'm happy to moderate those and um, have Dr. Norris address them. So one of the questions that did come in, um, Dr. Norris, is for you to talk a little bit about the difference between weathering and racial trauma. <clears throat> weathering and racial trauma. So I would say <clears throat> I'm not an expert on either one. We'll start with that. Uh, in my mind, um, racial trauma is one of the components that can lead to weathering. Right, so you can have, so racial trauma can lead to weathering, but then you can have trauma, there can be social, there can be uh, economic trauma, there can be um, political traumas and pressures, and so a variety of, so weathering is, in my mind, more encompasses the, the array of factors in society that can lead to additional stress and pressures and and that sort of uh, wear and tear and the increase in uh, activation of different physiologic processes, whereas racial trauma is more specific to just trauma related to, um, at least as I think about it, more specific from discrimination per se, and, rather than the, the broader um, context of factors that structural racism affects. But my, at least my interpretation, when I hear somebody say racial trauma, I'm thinking they're talking more specifically about racial dis uh, specific racial discrimination and trauma that occurs from that. Excellent. So then in terms of weathering, um, what would be the difference between weathering and allostatic load? <clears throat> Alice, they're, they're very similar. Allostatic load, in my mind, is a, a, a way to try to capture or measure weathering. So allostatic load is how we go and uh, capture some clinical and laboratory variables to try to estimate what the impact of quote unquote weathering has had on an individual's physiology. And so that's, that's a way that we, we then turn it into a variable that we can measure for research, or at least one of the variables we can use to measure for research. Thank you. Um, you know, at the beginning of the talk, you, you addressed a little bit about the role of, of personal preferences and health outcomes. And a question came in about, aren't personal beliefs and preferences also influenced by racism? Yes. So, so on that, I, great point. So we had a poll about that. And, and so to a large extent, so a lot of times, so I go back to uh, my colleague's manuscript where there was this debate with, between my colleague and the reviewer around personal beliefs and personal behaviors. Is it a disparity or is it a, a difference? I'd say to a large extent, most of our beliefs and behaviors are driven by external factors in society that force us in one they condition us in a way or we're influenced to make certain tough decisions sometimes. And so those would be considered disparities because they're influenced by the structures in society. Uh, 
it's, it's tough. We don't want to sort of say we're taking away all free will from people, but sometimes we've taken a lot of their free will away in certain settings. And so there is that balance. We, even when I think about social determinants of health, it, it, it sounds almost deterministic, like there's nothing anybody can do about it or any individual can do about it. And so uh, sometimes I think about, should we be using social indicators of health, right? Because there is free will. But I think most of it is driven by, most of it is in fact driven by the structures of the systems. And so determinants is probably captures it more so. And what we see is when some people are able to, for whatever reason, transcend or get through some of those barriers, then there's a narrative that says, oh, see, the system's not the problem. The problem is the group of people. And then they want to highlight that one, like that one lottery winner as, yeah, as, the, as the way to go. And, and, and to say the problem is not, everybody could be rich. If you all just would win the lottery, you would, you would all be rich, right? So yes, that was a great question. And I agree with the, the view from that question, questioner. Yeah, the other comment related to that, I think, is about, you know, we've been talking about external forms of racism and, and the systemic racism, racism that occurs in society, but what is the role of internalized racism? <clears throat> uh, again, very good question. So, so internalized racism has major roles on um, <clears throat> what we do and how we act and, um, and and it can, right, so we, we think about um, structural or institutional racism. I tend to think of structural as bigger and institutional maybe at, you know, because institutional may be at a, a health system, at a school system or something like that. And then there's personal mediated and then there's internalized, which you've internalized. So now you now believe that you are not as, that you are in fact less than. You've accepted the narratives and you believe you are less than. And that, influ that has a major influence on um, how people then act in society, how they carry themselves, their susceptibility to disease, their susceptibility to a, a lot of other narratives that are going around. So that internalized racism um, is yet another pathway, I guess, or another mechanism through which racism can have a significant impact on a group and on an individual. And so um, those are important things to think about when we're thinking about racism. Um, now, going back to the topic of health disparities research versus minority health research, which you addressed during the talk, um, couldn't comparing to the control or white group help to show or illustrate systemic disparities? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so so that's one of the, the uses of the disparities research, doing research and comparing a particular group to, in this society, um, the white population, majority population, it then gives one a sense of what some of the outcome differences may be for a, per, for a group that's navigating in a society that is outside the the power structures that be versus inside, and so so those those types of studies give us insights into those differences. If you want to look at do minority health research and look within a group, now you can try to get a better understanding of are there are there structures are there strategies within a group that are that may be more effective and be more resilient in, in um, protecting against disease with it recognizing that this group is in a bubble that is oppressed and disadvantaged in the society. But at least we do want to figure out ways to help every group thrive as much as possible in the, in the structure of society as we have it now while we try to change society. Thanks. 
And then in terms of um, going back to research, um, there's a specific question. <clears throat> what measures of allostatic, allostatic load are used to determine biological aging or cognitive aging? For cognitive aging, I don't know uh, biological markers. You know, there, I, there's probably work going on looking at um, MRIs and neuroimaging for cognitive aging per se. For biologic aging, usually we tend to look more, more commonly at cardiovascular markers. And, and so if people have um, increased blood pressure and at a, at, at a given age, increase, or I would say cardiometabolic. So increased blood pressure, increased level, increased uh, hemoglobin A1C or measures of insulin resistance. And then some of these uh, biologic, uh, some of these inflammatory markers, it, it gives us a sense. It's not really aging per se, but it, 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 but it probably, you know, if after controlling for other factors, a person has a more substantial cardiometabolic profile or abnormal cardiometabolic profile at the same age, it suggests that that's happened. Now, people are looking, there are, you know, people look at telomere length as a marker for aging. And, and so that is, um, it, it's probably of the markers, probably the best marker we have of quote unquote aging or potential, and to get a sense of whether or not an individual or group has premature aging related, you know, uh, relative to the general population. And so, and then there are others that people are looking at. I saw a good, a good comment in there about Obama's hair color may just be, because some people's hair turns gray early. Could be, could be. Good point. All right. And then, um, maybe, maybe it's so good. Maybe it's so about... gray before. Maybe it turned gray before and he was too busy as president to keep dying it. <laughs> um, staying on this theme of, you know, applications of this talk to our research, you know, there was a, there's a comment about um, why it's actually being poor comparators, especially for cancer incidence rates among um, American Indians. And so, you know, what can we do about moving the needle to not use whites as the gold standard or the control uh, <clears throat> reference group? Um. It's hard to say it is, as long, right? So it depends on what you look at. If, if you want to say, given the present structure of the society, then that ends up being the, um, the quote unquote reference group. If we have a society where all of these social determinants of health are equity, equitably distributed, then there no longer becomes really a reference group. And then it's just a matter of how a group is doing. You can still look at comparisons, but it's not necessarily a reference group. And, and again, there are, you know, for the white population, there are, you know, many diseases and disease conditions they have. There are struggles and variations within each group, right? And, and they're going to have, um, you know, there will be disparities within subpopulations within the overall white population as well. In a sense, what we can say is, given that we have worse out, the, the populations that have the worst outcomes in understanding the impact of both the social structure of society as well as a lot of other factors and understanding uh, resilience and biomarkers, can we now think about strategies that will be helpful, you know, those strategies that will help that group in greatest need should help everybody, right? And so that, that's sort of why I think work around both racial uh, ethnic disparities and minority health is important for the entire population because the lessons learned there could or should be helpful for everybody. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Norris, for being with us today. We really appreciate uh, your time. Folks on the line, please note that we will be sending out a brief survey, and we ask 
to uh, obtain your feedback, super helpful for us in our future programming. Um, thank you again to everybody that participated. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar in February on consort charts, so stay tuned to our RICMAR webinar series. Um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much. Okay.